Welcome to the American Bar Association Animals and Agriculture Subcommittee Program on Ventilation Shutdown, which was originally recorded on January 26, 2024. The program consists of a conversation between Cynthia von Schlichten and veterinarian Dr. Crystal Heath. Ventilation shutdown is the mass killing of animals via heat stroke by cutting off the natural or mechanical ventilation of the building where the animals are housed. A variation on this concept is ventilation shutdown plus, which is the same as VSD, but with the addition of heat pumped into the space. Both VSD and VSD plus are a type of depopulation. Depopulation is the mass killing of large numbers of animals typically occurring in response to urgent or emergency situations, including infectious disease outbreaks, both natural and man-made disasters. This typically involves the killing of all animals residing at a single location, such as a farm. Now let's pick up with the conversation with Cynthia and Crystal. From the quote I'm gonna read. The pig or poultry bird barn is closed, all air inlets and ventilation sealed, and fans turned off. Heaters, steam, and or gas are turned on. Body heat from the animals, combined with any added heat, raises the temperature in the house until the pigs or poultry birds die from hyperthermia or suffocation from built-up gases. This typically takes hours, according to all published research. So why is the use of ventilation shutdown and ventilation shutdown plus problematic? I mean, I think you can probably guess <laughs> based on the description, but um, in addition, it's becoming more commonly used in the U.S. for mass depopulation or mass execution. As you might have guessed, it's physically painful, injurious, and stressful to the animals. It can cause extended suffering and can take as long as 16 hours for an animal to die. And it's widely deemed unacceptable by animal welfare experts and really across the globe, which we'll talk about in a minute. So how did we get to this point in the US where it was becoming more commonly used? Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. Okay, so to back up a little bit, ventilation shutdown was used in 2014 or to 2015, four times over 14 months to combat an epidemic of avian influenza. And this was prior to the release of the American and Veterinary Medical Association's depopulation guidelines, which classified VSD as not recommended and VSD plus as permitted in constrained circumstances. And we'll talk more about those guidelines in a minute. Ventilation shutdown plus has become a standard method of depopulating poultry birds um, and livestock producers have also begun using it, um, justifying the use with the AVMA depopulation guidelines and veterinary approval in situations that don't even involve infection or zoonoses. For example, ventilation shutdown was used to depopulate um, hundreds of thousands of pigs, with my understanding, most notably in 2020 in Iowa. So to talk a little bit about the AVMA depopulation guidelines, they were published in 2019, and they were intended to provide guidance to veterinarians for options for killing animals in emergency situations. And the AVMA gathered input from a panel on depopulation or a pod of subject matter experts, including an ethicist and observers from the United States Department of Agriculture and the National Institutes of Health. The work of the pod was funded through a cooperative agreement between the AVMA and the USDA. So more specifically with regard to those guidelines, VSD alone is categorized as not recommended. It is a last resort and must only be considered when all other options have been thoughtfully considered and ruled out. VSD plus is permitted in constrained circumstances. And more specifically, that means it's permitted only when the circumstance of the emergency are deemed to constrain the ability to reasonably implement a preferred method, including constraints of disease, response time, human safety, efficiency, and deployable resources. Now, the USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, APHIS, is who governs the authority for VSD and VSD+. And they also administer the Animal Health Protection Act. The goal of the Animal Health Protection Act is the prevention, detection, control, and eradication of diseases and pests of animals that are essential to protect animal health, the health and welfare 
of the people, the economic interests of livestock and related industries in the U.S., the environment, and U.S. interstate and foreign commerce with regard to animals and other articles. The final deter determination to depopulate is made either state level or tribunal animal health officials and APHIS. Now, to look at the point of view of the U.S. versus sort of the rest of the world with regard to depopulation and animal welfare, it's pretty interesting. So up above here, we have a quote from the ABMA. And in relevant part, it says that these situations are given with as much consideration given to the welfare of animals as practicable. So that's sort of the language there. Now, the World Organization for Animal Health uh, is a much more committed phrase. Um, it says in relevant parts, methods used should result in immediate death or immediate loss of consciousness lasting until death. An induction of unconsciousness should not cause avoidable pain, anxiety, distress, or suffering in the animals. So that's a much more committed phrase with regard to a focus on welfare than the ABMA's phrase. And looking at the rest of the world, these are kind of viewpoints on VSD and VSD plus across the globe. And I'm not going to read all of these, but you can see that they are pretty opposed across the board. For example, the European Food Safety Authority says the killing of pigs with methods that are highly painful, such as ventilation shutdown with or without additional provision of heat or CO2, should not be used on welfare grounds. The OIE, who we just heard from, does not recognize ventilation shutdown in any form. And the Australian Veterinary Emergency Plan for Destruction of Animals says VSD is an unacceptable method to depopulate birds given the animal welfare concerns and lack of scientific evidence around its effectiveness. Okay, so at this point, that's your primer. I am going to turn things over to Dr. Heath, but first I wanna tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Crystal Heath is a shelter veterinarian and was recently named one of Vox's 2023 Future Perfect 50, which honors the scientists, thinkers, scholars, writers, and activists working on solutions for today's and tomorrow's biggest problems. She is the executive director of Our Honor, a nonprofit that supports veterinary students, veterinarians, and other animal professionals in speaking their conscience to create more ethical systems that consider the best interests of all species. She is also on the board of LEAP, Leaders for Animal Ethics, or Ethics, Animals, and the Planet, known as the Humane Alternative to 4-H and FFA, which aims to transform today's youth into the humane leaders of tomorrow who advocate for and work towards an equitable future for all living beings and the planet. Dr. Heath is also on the founding committee for the Veterinarians Against Ventilation Shutdown. Hello, Dr. Heath. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, thank you so much for having me and giving me this platform to talk about this. It's so wonderful that you're able to speak with us, and it's great to get uh, this perspective that we normally don't have. As I said, we're usually just talking to each other, <laughs> so it's great to hear from a veterinarian. Uh, so I'm going to get right started with the questions. Um, what Can you tell me a little bit more about the relationship that exists between the USDA and the ABMA? Yeah, and... Um, First, I, I just want to say, if it, I know there might be a lot of people from the AVMA, USDA, or people involved in depopulation who might listen to this, and I just want to say, if I say anything inaccurate, like, please correct me, please reach out to me, and because I don't want to perpetuate any false information, um, but it has been very hard to get a lot of information because there is such a lack of dialogue and so many people are scared to talk about this topic. So um, I just wanna start off by saying that, but um, basically the U USDA and the American Veterinary Medical Association formed a cooperative agreement. And this sort of came about after the, the first avian influenza outbreak in 2015. They realized that there were a lot of problems, a lot of, um, there was a lot of confusion people were unsure about what to do and there was no strict guidelines. And so each farm was a, a brand new thing and they wanted to figure out, okay, how can we set some policy related to types of poultry houses, um, different facilities and what's the best way to go about doing this. And so with this cooperative agreement, the USDA now looks to the AVMA guidelines on depopulation to set 
policy and indemnity payments for to producers to compensate them for the loss of their birds and the cost of depopulation when the outbreak happens at their habit. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the AVMA's decision to support this practice in what they call constrained circumstances? Yeah, and um, so there was this study done at the Prestige Department of Poultry Science at North Carolina State University. And this is a department named after Prestige Farms, which is a uh, poultry and egg producer. And this was a uh, research that was funded by a $100,000 grant from the US Poultry and Egg Association. So basically what you have here is industry funded data being used to legitimize mass killing methods that are then used by the AVMA um, to make their guidelines and then that dictates policy that is then put back, given back to the industry when these methods are used. Um, and it, it, this was paid for, this, this original research was done by, you know, and paid for by this very industry that is now giving government bailouts for doing this. Um, so there's not much research to support this use in pigs and um, the the National Pork Board's Patrick Webb was the chair of the the swine working group and on the day that the the AVMA guidelines were due the director of the animal welfare division then sent back an email to Patrick Webb urging that the language last resort be removed um, and this allowed heat stroke based killing to remain as a method to be used in constrained circumstances instead of a, a method that was not recommended for pigs. Um, and sh she basically said, we have an issue with the VSD section. There's a statement in the section stating that VSD should only be used as a last resort. If that is the case, then VSD should be listed as not recommended instead of permitted in constrained circumstances. In order to keep from downgrading the method, we suggest the attached language be used instead, and she provides some attached language. Um, and then after the 2020 COVID-19 slaughterhouse bottleneck that you spoke of previously, um, Patrick Webb then sent an email um, back, you know, kind of saying, uh, you know, they would, there was a long discussion between pork industry leaders about whether VSD plus could be used to depopulate pigs in this case, which was sort of an economic concern, but also a welfare concern because they had not planned for any slaughterhouse bottleneck, pigs were outgrowing their pens. And he was saying basically that uh, if you do it, you, you don't have a leg to stand on with the AVMA's guidance here. Um, then the pork industry went back to the director of the animal welfare division who basically gave the green light that VSD was okay in this slaughterhouse bottleneck case and said, we believe that the situation with the closing of the slaughter plants in the United States may warrant depopulation events in urgent circumstances. And we may need to apply techniques such as VSD plus. So again, green lighting this in a situation that wasn't a emergency disease outbreak. Um, this was really kind of done for the first time and for economic lack of planning reasons more than anything else. Yeah, that's really disheartening <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, okay, can you how can the support be reconciled with the mission of the AVMA, which includes advancing the science and practice of veterinary medicine to improve animal health and any other aspect of the mission that you want to add? Um, how, how, does, how do those two be reconciled? 
Well, the, the principles of veterinary medical ethics state that a veterinarian shall be influenced only by the welfare of the patient, the needs of the client, and the safety of the public, and the need to uphold the, the public trust vested in the veterinary profession, and shall avoid any conflict of interest or the appearance thereof. A veterinarian shall not allow any interests, especially financial interests, other than those mentioned above to influence the choice and the treatment and the care of the animal. Um, but the AVMA is an industry organization and they have stakeholders and they only hire people who align with their stakeholders. The director of the Animal Welfare Division is affiliated with the U.S. Poultry and Egg Association and Dean Foods, among others. And so there's a great deal of rationalization that happens in, in veterinary medicine. There's this kind of this lesser of two evils mentality. And, and we're normalized to the, the idea that we have to use harmful methods in order to achieve the greater good. And we st this is kind of started off early on in our education. Um, the use of terminal laboratories in veterinary school and things like that. Um, and there's a lack of urgency to change harmful systems. We haven't really been taught as veterinarians how to change systems, how to argue against things. We kind of mm -hmm. accept things as an unchangeable fact. And we learn early on in veterinary school, if you push back, if you say, hey, this way we're being taught is unethical and we wanna change things to align with the science, they face backlash. And so in order to get ahead, you kind of learn to keep your head down and not complain about things. So it just creates this culture that's committed to the status quo. Yeah, it kind of starts that desensitization earlier. And I know I have friends um, who've gone through veterinary school and have had that very issue where they've sort of questioned um, how things were done from an ethical perspective and have really been met with a lot of resistance. So yeah. that's really unfortunate. It just seems so at odds with the whole reason you got into it. <laughs> you know? um, do you think most vets are aware of the AVMA's position of the use of ventilation shutdown plus? Most vets are not, unfortunately. I go to veterinary conferences and I talk to people and most people are shocked and still don't know, despite all of the news stories about this, which, you know, we're all very busy working on our own practices and, and staying in our own lanes. And there's only a small percentage of veterinarians who actually do work with livestock animals and most small animal veterinarians don't really take an interest in those issues um, because we only have, we have limited time. Um, and I was shocked to hear recently a student um, had a, a meeting with the VP of the AVMA um, who came to their school and was talking about this and the VP of the AVMA didn't even realize sort of a lot of the history of, of BSD and the fact that I forgot to to bring this up in, in the last question, but we were barred from attending the AVMA's Humane Ending Symposium, many of us who are against VSD. So that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why this doesn't change is because they don't allow people like us who are advocating against it into the rooms to discuss these issues. Um, so, but this wow. the, the, the AVMA hadn't even heard that, even though it was a major news story in, in veterinary news. Wow, that's incredible. Can you talk a little bit, and this might be a trigger for some people, so I just want to put a trigger warning out there. Um, can you talk a little bit about the suffering these animals endure who are subjected to VSD plus? Yeah, we know across species that animals dying from heat stroke experience GI bleeding and sloughing of their GI tracts, vomiting, bloody diarrhea, enlargement of their abdominal organs a breakdown of muscle tissue, respiratory distress, brain injury, and internal bleeding. And in dogs, we know the cause of death is often because they, they can't breathe because of frothy, bloody fluid in their airways. And pigs are less sensitive to heat damage to the brain compared to humans and other species because they have this anatomic cooling system, this carotid, carotid reed and rable that cools the brain. So they remain conscious for a lot longer. And um, the, the steam used to kill pigs even burns the skin. We don't use steam in, in birds, but we did in the pig barns and um, it also causes inhalation burns. 
the birds also have the same anatomic cooling system. And so when they have this, they suffer for a prolonged period of time and remain conscious, feeling everything without, you know, becoming unconscious. Wow, that's just horrendous. Uh, are there any constrained circumstances, in your opinion, where you believe VSD plus can or should be used? Um, I, I just personally think that if you take responsibility for the lives of animals, you're responsible for ensuring that they are fed and watered and housed and have a life li worth living. And when they have to be killed, that you do that in a way that's quick and humane. And here we've gotten into the situation where the numbers of animals are so large and there's no responsibility for producers to do this. They, and the, the, the whole system is so interconnected that they feel like they are reliant on regulatory bodies so much that the regulatory bodies should have a responsibility to them to solve this problem when when these things happen for them. So they there's no like personal responsibility to make sure that the, their birds, their animals are killed in a quick, humane way. Um, and this is sort of just how this this sort of thing happens. I, I definitely think that producers, if they're bringing in billions of dollars and like Jenny at Turkey Store got more than 85 million dollars in bailouts their ceo is making more than six million dollars a year they have a responsibility for stockpiling the equipment needed to depopulate their animals in a less cruel way so i don't think that there's any circumstance where this should be used and it's only being used because there's a lack of planning in place yeah in your opinion, is there a low bar set by the USDA for producers to satisfy the requirement that there be constrained circumstances present? In other words, is this a fairly easy burden to meet? Yeah, there in the guidelines, it's very vague about what constrained circumstances means. And there's no requirement that these corporations or these government agencies put plans in place to use less cruel methods. Um, and so reasons that they have given for using these methods include anything from lack of trained staff, lack of ability to get supplies quick enough. Um, and these companies are repeatedly bailed out without having to you know, plan for the next event, which is, is pretty concerning um, that it just keeps happening over and over and over again. Um, and they're they're kind of using any reason that they can to legitimize using this. Yeah, as lawyers, I feel like we would have a field day with the vague factors for constrained circumstances. Um, and sort of something you just alluded to, what incentivizes these companies to use VSD Plus? Um, well, they basically, you know, you fill out a form, you they always say, well, I have to rationalize VSD, I can't just use it, but they they basically copy and paste the reasons um, for using VSD and then they get a stamp of approval and then they get compensated for their loss of their birds via taxpayer subsidized bailouts. And I talked about Jenny O's Turkey Store getting more than $85 million. Tyson Foods got $29 million while their CEO brought in more than $13 million. And it just goes down the line. In total, we've bailed out these companies with more than $715 million since 2022. Um, and now the USDA has started a pilot program from what I understand where they are now compensating companies for depopulation costs based on a flat rate. So that means they are, the, the producers are incentivized to um, keep the, the methods as cost effective as possible um, to the point where, you know, it, it might even compromise animal welfare, um, which is very concerning. Like, you know, trying to save energy when they do use VSD by turning down the heat and it taking longer to kill the birds. Right, um, so concerning. 
Have you ever worked with farmers who have used VSD Plus? And if so, what is your understanding of their experience using this practice for mass execution? Not, I mean, not farmers specifically. Um, I would love to talk to some of these big leaders who are, you know, the ones bringing in millions and millions of dollars and decide not to put plans in place. But I have, you know, talked to veterinarians and other people who have participated in depopulation, who are now sitting on the panel on depopulation. And, um, you know, there's nobody wants to do this. There's a lot of mental distress, but they kind of view this as an unchangeable fact. They have to. Um, there's no other option under current systems because there, there, there just hasn't been this urgency to change the current systems. Um, and if you're just a lower level person trying to solve this problem and you show up to a facility to depopulate, you in that circumstance don't have a whole lot of power to change this massive system. Um, and especially not when you're going to be ostracized and potentially use lose your ability to collaborate with others if you go to the media and you speak about these things and you highlight this as a problem. You might be shunned by the industry and not, not hired or even fired from your job. So, um, but there's a great deal of mental distress. I know there was a study done that 10% of swine veterinarians even considered suicide related to depopulation. So it's it's really tragic. And the people who have to do this are also victims of this whole system too. Yeah, I can definitely appreciate that. That is just horrific. And I can't imagine, I can't imagine going to vet school and then it coming down to that. You know, I mean, it it's just coming down to something you have to face. It, starting out at one point and ending up at this point must be, um, you know, devastating for many. Are there other forms of VSD plus that are less cruel than others? Um, well, VSD plus means ventilation shutdown with the addition of heat. Um, this method is only to be used in constrained circumstances. Ventilation shutdown alone is not recommended unless in the case of like neonates, fertilized eggs, embryos, um, things like that, you can use just VSD. People confuse this with the addition of CO2, which is when you seal up the barns and you pump in CO2, that is known as whole house gassing. And that is a preferred method. Um, the birds die in theory quicker that way. But the problem is that method, there's there's not enough um, equipment, trained people ready to, to uh, dispatch to do that. Carbon dioxide is very expensive like costing like eleven to forty thousand dollars for a tinker truck, um, it's hard to get. I, from talking to a lot of people, it sounds like a lot of the CO two companies don't want their CO two going to this for this reason, and they're also contracted to sell to beverage companies. So that whole supply chain issue is very um, confusing and concerning, and so that's why one of these most more preferred methods isn't really used. Yeah, that's interesting. I never thought about the same CO2, com CO2 companies that would be um, doing this, would also be doing beverage company. I mean, it totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, it's just interesting to think that that would be all the same company. Um, you could see why they might prefer to not gear their business towards this. What are the justifications set forth by producers for using VSD Plus versus other less cruel methods of mass execution? I mean, my understanding, I'm assuming it's a money saving thing, but do they provide any other? Um, so they believe that efficiency and saving costs, I mean, is that the primary reason that they give for using it or are there other reasons? I think, yeah, from what I've seen from the um, public records that we've, we've received public records from all over the United States, but one example is um, the Oregon Department of Agriculture records that we got um, about a foster farms depopulation where foster farms received more than $8 million in indemnity payments for the loss of their birds. They said that after just two of the 20 poultry houses were depopulated, they had, quote, exhausted our stockpile to foam concentrate. And it's like, why was that? Why had you not plan to have more available um, with the threat of avian influenza being a known fact since 2015 and this being an ongoing issue. 
Um, they said that the owner and producer have requested BSD plus due to the inability to timely depopulate by foam. Um, and they, they go through the less cruel methods and they said that whole house gassing with CO2 would require more CO2 than is currently available within Oregon. Um, foam would require at least one additional foam unit beyond what is needed at the other broiler facility and 300 gallons of foam concentrate and ne neither of those were available through the national veterinary stockpile till at least Friday. And they were worried this would cause a threat. This delay would mean that the other facilities in the area would be infected. And they also were worried that if more birds were to die in these houses, that would create sort of a heat sink and the VSD itself would work, be less effective. So there was just this worry that um, there was there was just not a, a way to do this in a, in a fast way other than VSD, which is a problem that needs to be corrected. Yeah, um, thank you for that. So clearly you referenced it just a minute ago, avian influenza is detrimental to commercially produced animals, but can the practice also have an impact on wildlife? And how so, if that is the case? Yeah, um, I mean, we've all heard that the, the polar bear in Alaska just passed away and many mammals are affected by this. 17,000 elephant seal pups have died in Argentina. 96% of the juvenile population, 5,000 seals or, or sea lions died in Peru. Um, there's at least 320 types of birds and dozens of species of, of mammals affected. And 41% of all Peruvian pelicans have died. Um, and so there's been multiple comments in the media by producers and people working in the industry making analogies about wild birds basically dropping bombs onto um, poultry facilities with infected with avian influenza. So like they're this sort of warlike language um, kind of starting this whole war against wildlife um, to stop the spread of the disease. And we've gotten documents from um, Minnesota that basically says, APHIS Wildlife Services officials are now planning to control some wildlife species at or adjacent to commercial facilities, which is really concerning. Um, and, you know, as this can affect mammals, this can also affect our own species. And recent work out of Harvard, um, led by Aaron Bernstein, shows that animal agriculture facilities do create the threat for the next pandemic. And he says that high density livestock operations can serve as an opportune environment for spillover from wild animals onto livestock or as incubators for pandemic influenza strains. And large pig and poultry farms are where the genetic reassortment needed to source pandemic influenza strains may most likely occur. Um, so with these indemnity payments in our policies, we're just kind of incentivizing what could create the next pandemic. Yeah, and then it becomes sort of a, an endless cycle, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Wow, those those stats are amazing. I mean, it, it's it's common sense, I think, that the wildlife would be impacted, but that those um, stats are really horrifying. Uh, why do you think the use of VSD plus in the U.S. differs so greatly from that of other countries? I alluded in the opening presentation that other countries are by and large opposed to this practice. So why do why do you think it's so different here? I mean, the basic fact is our farms here are so much larger than than farms in other countries. I mean, Italy and the Netherlands took VSD off the table. They started getting really creative because they ran into the same problems we did. They didn't have CO2. Um, and so they started using liquid nitrogen that was vaporized into barns. Um, and we've all, we're all kind of, I've gotten so many messages lately about nitrogen um, killing because of the recent death penalty case. Kenneth Smith was killed last night using nitrogen and there was concerns about that. Um, we do know many people have accidentally passed away from nitrogen inhalation and, and many people have committed suicide using nitrogen, 
reaction and inhalation with, you know, scuba gear and such. Um, different species react differently to hypoxia and inert gases usually for pig and poultry species do work quite well. And there's a lot of studies and it's definitely uh, less cruel than mass killing with heat stroke, but definitely not perfect. Um, and so that's, that's sort of kind of what other countries are doing using these other methods. But like the United States is particularly interesting because in other countries, veterinarians um, collaborate more with animal protection advocates to advance legislation to protect animals. Here in the United States, we're still one of the, the rare countries who has not banned declawing, we have not banned uh, ear cropping. Um, so we, we don't have the animal protections that some European countries do. We still have veterinary students participate in labs where animals are killed. Um, and other countries don't have an organization like the AVMA that is basically working for the interest of stakeholders, corporations, corporate interests, and wielding the veterinarians' moral authority to advance um, some of their policies and stop animal protection legislation. Think of Prop 12 um, and Prop 2. I remember the AVMA wrote a letter to the New York Times um, opposing California's Prop 2. Uh, the American Association of Swine Veterinarians, which is a AVMA allied organization, wrote a amicus brief to the Supreme Court um, opposing Prop Prop 12, and that really inspired many of us to get together and write our own amicus brief supporting Prop 12. Um, hopefully, things are changing, but the AVMA is is very powerful, and they want to stop any advancement of animal protection and welfare because ultimately they are working for the interests of large corporations like Cargill, like, um, you know, Charles River Labs. Uh, they they want it, their priority is about their economic interests and the belief that in order to feed the world, we have to ensure the economic viability of these agriculture, these animal agriculture industries. Um, so, yeah, I feel like, I feel like the public almost is under the misapprehension that the AVMA is is strictly an ally to animals, and it's 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 really a misinterpretation <laughs> of what's going on. It sounds like um, they're confused too. I mean, I yeah really look into it, and that story hasn't been told. I've been trying to get the media to write more about this and what I found, um, and it's hard to get that story told. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like anything that that flies in the face of this industry is is hard to get told for sure. So, what we have a ton of questions from from people in the audience, which is so great. So, let me just ask you one more question, and then we'll go to those. What can people do to try and stop this industry from this practice? This is kind of like a loaded question, but any kind of um, suggestion you have to help try people can try to make a difference in stopping this practice. Yeah, talk to your representatives like first. I know this is a big ask and um, I talk, you don't want your taxpayer dollars going to large corporations who harm animals. Um, so we wanna make sure that these large companies put plans in place to end the lives of their animals in a less barbaric way. Um, and our honor, my organization will have some emails and, and drafts and templates you can use to talk to your representatives. So go to ourhonor.org and you can sign up for our newsletter and we'll share those that information with you and some action that you can take. But also pay attention to what's going on in your local community. Um, as these facilities start to expand, Pittman Family Farms is expanding in Lemoore, California, and they received nearly $23 million in, in bailouts and they used VSD to kill their birds, but they're planning on um, building 16 new poultry barns, um, and that would mean 485,000 more chickens um, and a big 432,000 square foot uh, new poultry barns, which is just huge. Um, but the people of Lamore are, are active and they don't want to see that happen, so that's great. Cold Spring Egg Farms in Wisconsin it was... Uh, 
the location of a really botched depopulation that took over six, I think 16 days or something, and they've received nearly $15 million in bailouts. They killed 2.75 million birds, um, and they want to expand to five to six million birds. So people, if you're in these local communities where these facilities, where Jenny O, where Tyson, where these other facilities are considering expanding, let me know, share that with our honor, and we can take action on this um, and talk about it. Um, but sign up with at ourhonor.org to learn more and follow us on social media and tell your veterinarian too. Like they don't know about this. We have some flyers you can share with your vet. Um, let them know that we're a group that is going to help them um, advance better treatment for animals. Great. Thank you for that. Um, you know, you feel so helpless in these situations. So it's nice to know that we can try to do something. So I'm going to switch gears. That was great. Um, I just love talking to you. I could talk to you all day about this. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to switch gears. There's a, a bunch of questions. Um, the first question is, um, are there any alternatives to VSD that you um, would recommend or that you think would make sense um, that you could recommend to the AVMA? High expansion nitrogen foam is one that's been talked about a lot and has a lot has a lot of good data but it's disturbing because ventilation shutdown was a method to be used in constrained circumstances there have been a ton of studies on ventilation shutdown now and water-based foaming um too and not a lot of studies done using high expansion nitrogen foam or even vaporize nitrogen in some of these large facilities. And um, funding for these studies have been pulled. Um, so there, that's concerning, but I think we should start considering using each of these depopulation events as testing grounds for less barbaric methods than VSD. If you're resorting to using VSD at a facility, we really need to get all the researchers in. And I understand that there's a lot of researchers might be um, concerned about doing this sort of research and publishing this work publicly because they might be targeted by activists. Um, but I hope they might be willing to talk to me. I want to help bridge the divide between activists and the veterinary community and say, like, look, what are we supposed to do here? Let's do something less barbaric than what we're doing. Um, and let's, you know, see if some of these less cruel methods could be used. Yeah, thank you for that. The next question I, I can sort of um, answer, <laughs> and then you can add to it, of course, uh, how do we bring legislation public consumer attention to VSD? People may change their habits if they know what they're paying for. Um, and you talked about that earlier, a bit, a little bit about what we can do. The only other thing I would add to that is two things. And I say this all, I feel like I say this five times a week at least, but I think public awareness is underutilized in our movement in general. And we kind of just assume that people know about stuff and they don't know. We know because we talk about it all day long, but I think the general public really has no idea. So being verbal about these things that are happening, I think is so important. And then I know that there have been some legislative efforts and I don't, someone else might be able to speak to this better than me, but I know there were some legislative efforts um, to ban uh, the use of ESD plus in certain jurisdictions, and then also to halt the indemnity payments uh, um, if a producer or farmer decides to use ESD plus. And neither of those, or those have not been successful to my knowledge so far, but that's um, something that has been happening in terms of a legislative effort. Do you have anything to add to that, Crystal? Or, or I mean, I would love for, I mean, the, why, oops, nobody wants to do this. Why are they doing this is because they're worried about disease spread. So the problem is there are barriers in place that are preventing the more, the less cruel. I don't say more humane because these aren't humane <laughs> methods by any means. So I always say less cruel. Um, there are barriers to getting these less cruel methods to these facilities fast enough. So before banning something, like let's talk about de like putting the, the plan in place to use less cruel methods. Nobody is just doing this because they're sadists. Um, they, they're, they believe that this is the only method. So what can we do to put these less cruel methods in place? And, but ultimately like 
we should start to seriously consider scaling down animal agriculture, large scale animal agriculture. So much money is going to these large corporations while small corporations and slaughter free food producers aren't getting that money. And we should be redirecting funds and increasing access to slaughter free foods. Um, that's the key here. Um, and it, it, it's like we, we kind of are telling people like find out about this and be horrified and go vegan. And like the idea that people can just go vegan and solve this problem is, is foolish because there's so many barriers in place preventing people from doing that. And, um, you know, the meat industry has marketed um, these foods to us for so long. It's, it's extremely difficult under current systems for a lot of people to do that. It's very expensive. It's like, why is pineapple, a container of pineapple $14? And it's so easy to get a hamburger for much less than that. Um, we need to change those dynamics. Um, so yeah, definitely. And I was thinking about the reference you made earlier about um, large companies who've gotten these like bailouts and for use of VSD plus, and then, and then you're saying how they're expanding and how crazy that is. I mean, obviously you don't have a handle on your current capacity. Maybe you need, <laughs> maybe get a handle on that before you expand. Um, it is disconcerting at best. Um, yeah. So there is a comment here. This is this is a very ABA comment, which I'm on board with. <laughs> um, maybe it'll take a lawsuit to bring more attention to this issue and permit a change. I mean, I'm all for litigation. Um, I think one of the challenges here, obviously, is that this is uh, very legal and there aren't a lot of um, uh, guidelines or restrictions in place around it. I, I, I don't know if you agree with that, say that's fair to say, Dr. Heath, but that's sort of the impression I get with regard to the, pra the practice itself. Um, yeah, I mean, Minnesota law says that you need to provide animals with fresh circulating air. This is clearly a violation of Minnesota law and many other animal cruelty laws, but because it's industry standard, mm -hmm. it's fine. How do, do right. things become industry standard? My profession legitimizes it, like mm -hmm. from gestation crates to pastrating pigs without anesthesia and dehorning without anesthesia and all of the things, gas chambers and pigs. This how this becomes industry standard because we re legitimize it. So yes, I mean some action needs to take place, but it's like all of us we've sort of conditioned people to accept this to then all of a sudden say oh now it's illegal now we're going to punish you like all of a sudden it's like not fair <laughs> like so yeah um i hope nobody wants to hurt animals so it's like let's give ways for people not to hurt animals <laughs> and change their systems yeah i almost wonder if the source is at is going after the avma in some way i almost feel like the endorsement of these practices is, is at odds with what it purports to, it, its mission purports to do, you know, and is there something there? I don't know. From exactly. A, yeah. And yeah. A lot of people don't understand that they're, it's, it's a going against their stated mission. Is right. Yeah. Right. So is there something there from a litigation aspect? I don't know, but and that'd be what I was thinking. It's a, like they pr are preventing me from going to their humane ending symposium, me and many others when that influences USDA policy, then they're preventing many of us from even sitting on the panel and depopulation. So if they're influencing government institutions and not letting us, is it a free speech issue at some point? Right, maybe. And then, and you were saying about how, you know, their decisions aren't supposed to be driven by financial uh, aspects, right? And then this is like all about financial, really, is kind of what it comes down to. So that's, really seems at odd, but yeah, there could be a constitutional issue out there as well, I agree. So maybe maybe some some good stuff to work there with, with regard to a lawsuit to the to that person's comment. Um, this next one, I just gave a talk last week and I talked about VSD plus a little bit and I sort of gave this comparison. So let's see what you think about this. Um, it says the public doesn't know what death or hyperthermia looks like, but they are somewhat aware of state laws about the rescue of dogs in hot cars um, like Colorado, for example, allows people to break a window to save a dog. Can we extend awareness of VSD via this comparison? 
Yeah. And I think a lot of people have done that. Um, yeah. That's yeah. You wouldn't, we don't kill shelter dogs by locking them in hot cars. Why are we doing the same to pigs and poultry birds? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. That was sort of what I said too last yeah. week. Mm -hmm. And we know this is inhumane in the U S I mean, all these other countries are saying we're not doing this because it's inhumane is it the main reason or that's the purported reason, but we know it's inhumane too. We have all these laws saying you can't lock your dog or cat in a hot car and you're allowed to break into that car and you can be charged with animal cruelty if you let your dog or cat die that way, you know, but so we know it's inhumane, but for some reason here, not only is it not inhumane, but we're going to pay these companies to do it, you know? Yeah. So. And you have to know the industry's response to that is, well, it's also inhumane to let the birds die over many days of avian influenza. So, um, <laughs> yes, true. So let's work together to like figure out how we can kill right. and their lives in a more rapid way than right. Either. <laughs> and also figure out ways to like minimize avian influenza from spreading you yes. know that might be another thing <laughs> um this quest this comment about cctv I'm, I'm conscious of time um cctv streaming publicly so public shares the trauma of workers and vets and demands change i know that's common i believe in other countries like the uk but not here is that right do you know um I, yeah We've brought up that with the gas chambers, the pig slaughterhouse gas chambers, because mm -hmm. the only method of slaughter that is not viewable by inspectors, and I know other countries do that. I don't think it's visible to the public, though, and you, you obviously don't want cameras on workers because there's privacy issues there. But I also worry about there, like the people who do this on a daily basis are, are realizing they're not you know, seeing their daily work and then going vegan or something, you know, slaughterhouse workers aren't going vegan. People become normalized to violence and they, they realize like, oh, this is an unchangeable fact. So if without the proper framing, it's, I don't think it's beneficial. And I, so, but I do think there needs to be more transparency and labeling and all of the things and more public awareness just about with like cigarette smoke, uh, you know, cigarettes and things like that. People need to be aware of this. Yeah, I think that's a good analogy. Um, someone wrote, given the inclusion of the given inclusion of the AVMA VSD solutions in vet school curriculum would be really hard. What would be a good way to get this information to current vet students? And I, I assume your organization probably does this to a point. Um, could the VA VSD have student chapters or some kind of vet student engagement? Yeah, our honor has uh, vet student chapters. And, and it's funny, Back in 2020, um, Florida vet students organized around this and wanted to write a letter to the ABMA. The pork board stepped in and said, we're going to take control over this and we'll do a town hall. And they framed it in this way that really made it seem like it was wrong to criticize ventilation shutdown. And it's amazing the rationalization that you can do and that's the concerning thing is students aren't taught we need to teach vet students how change happens how social change happens how veterinarians can be part of greater social change and vet students learn that the way things are are an unchangeable fact and you are faced with these constant moral challenges and you have to choose between the way things are you know, between one bad idea and another. And they're they're not really shown the whole picture and the story and the economic interests that have led things to become the way that they are. So I think that students really need to understand that. They need to understand the history of veterinary medicine and of farming and how things became industry standard, how things used to be. Um, because things have changed because of student activism, like terminal surgeries in veterinary schools. We used to have mm -hmm. students perform many surgeries on an animal over a period of weeks and then kill them. But because the students got active, that is going away. Um, then they changed it to just one surgery and then killing the animal, which also isn't good. And now they're, we're getting rid of that altogether. Um, so I think students need to be empowered to be angry about the way things are instead of just to be hopeless and helpless. 
Um, and I think that's where a lot of change will happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was in vet tech school briefly a million years ago, and I'm having flashbacks to when we were supposed to dissect cats, and I refused to do it, and it was quite the uproar. Um, <laughs> oh, you can't be a tech, a vet tech then, because you can't, you don't, you're not strong enough. Yeah, I, I took the F on all of the labs, but the um, lecture professor who was at of the same class who was actually the department chair like supported it and I still ended up getting a B in the class and then she worked on trying to find me alternatives so she said I'm sure you're not the only one that feels that way but the lab professor really took it hard she did not like it and she made a big scene every time I would like leave the room when they would get the cats out it was a whole thing so I, I'm glad there's been some progress there even though we have a long way to go um I someone said about the lawsuit thing which is a good idea they said maybe you could file a lawsuit about the environmental ramifications of disposing millions of dead birds at once. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. not a bad idea. <laughs> Cold Spring Egg Farm um, in Wisconsin, they piled them up in a pretty much residential area and there's some concerns about the water contamination from that and everything. So yeah, yeah. I'm surprised there haven't been more, but a lot of these rural areas, they don't know that they can and they're also scared to talk about it, so. Yeah, and that, this industry is certainly no stranger to polluting the environment, um, you know, and affecting those communities and kind of getting away with it. So, and just, so we're about at time, but I'm going to ask one last question. And I think this comes back to your sort of lesser of two evils point that you made earlier, but um, isn't CO2 painful mm -hmm. um, based on a New York Times article they read about paid gassing? Is it painful, but is it perhaps maybe a better, better than the other options or the options being used. Yeah, it, it's not great. And it, pigs respond differently to it than birds do. But still, I I don't want to assume that it's pain-free by any means. And I think inert gases are better than CO2 um, for okay. sure. With like the, the water-based foam that occludes their airway, so they're suffocating. That's not good. The high expansion foam is great because it doesn't occlude their airway. It's big bubbles of inert gas. Um, and so they just pass out and they're able to expel the excess CO2. So there's not that air hunger and anxiety. We don't know if birds feel that same air hunger and anxiety that humans or pigs might feel. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. But it sounds like at least, you know, it's a better option for some probably. Yeah. Well, we're about at time. Do, is there anything you want to just kind of close with? Um, I, I know I'm sure everyone is is so glad that you took the time to speak with us. I thought it was really, really interesting um, and just great to get your perspective on on all of this. Um, any parting thoughts? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And I, if anybody from the industry um, wants to discuss or if I said anything wrong or I could say anything better, please reach out um, and please email me. You can email me at cheath.rhonor.org or go to our website. Um, and because I want to be accurate and I also want to be fair because I am not out to vilify the industry or anybody who has been sort of led to to believe that this is the humane way to go. I think we all want better for the animals. And so let's all work together, activists, industry together to make things better for the animals. Um, and I don't think anybody should be attacked or hurt or vilified because we live in this world where things are the way they are. Um, and I think we all, if we all work together we can achieve change a lot faster than if we um, are scared to talk if you're scared to talk there's something wrong there's something you need to talk about so um don't be scared to talk <laughs> yeah i think that's a great model for life in general <laughs> if you're scared to talk there's probably something you need to talk about yeah well said well thank you so so much i can see that everyone else um is really appreciative of your time and really um so interesting. So thank you so, so much for, for spending this hour with us. And thank you everyone who attended. Thanks y'all. Have a good day. Bye. Have a good day. Bye.